In this video, we're going to take a quick look at a simple transistor amplifier and illustrate how output, when fed back into the input of the amplifier, produces oscillations. We'll consider a common emitter amplifier circuit and demonstrate both the need for and design of a phase shifting network. Here's a simple single transistor amplifier circuit. For an excellent description of the circuit, see the ARRL Hands-On Radio Series Volume 1, in which the motivation for the chosen values of resistors and capacitors is explained in depth. Briefly, this is an NPN 3904 based amplifier. Because the emitter of the transistor appears in both the input and the output of the circuit, this is often called a common emitter amplifier. There is a very clear and readable piece in the ARRL handbook on the design of transistor amplifier circuits, which I recommend reading to better understand this and similar circuits. To illustrate two facets of this circuit, we can feed it a simple sinusoidal signal displayed here in yellow. First, in blue, we can see that the amplified signal is roughly five times the amplitude of the input signal. The scale here for yellow is 500 millivolts uh, per division, uh, and it's the same for the blue trace. So there's about a factor of five difference there. You can see some nonlinearity in the blue signal in the output, and we can understand that a little bit better by looking at the FFT. So, go to math. FFT on. All right, and so this is the FFT. Let's give it a lot, of, a lot more samples. So this is the FFT of the input signal. This peak right here corresponds to about 12 kilohertz, and uh, it's pretty clean, uh, some noise attenuated uh, down. But if we now go and we look at the FFT of the output signal on channel two, we see that we have first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic uh, peaks out there. So when we uh, go back now to the time domain, you can see that's the nature of these, uh, you know, the, the kind of wide peak and narrow dip there. So there's a little bit of nonlinearity present, but uh, it doesn't look too bad. So the second thing I want to show is that uh, we can see that the output is out of phase with respect to the input. And it's out of phase by 180 degrees. So when the input is at a maximum, the output is at a minimum. And when the input is at a minimum, the output is at a maximum. This is common to all common emitter transistor amplifiers. So you may have heard feedback from PA or public address systems that have too much mic gain, or maybe in a telephone when the volume is up so high that it feeds back into the receiver. The resulting squeal or oscillations occur from feeding some of the output back into the amplifying input. So it's often useful to think of an oscillator as an amplifier with feedback. However, uh, as we can see on the oscilloscope, the 180 degree phase shift of the output with respect to the input would tend to destructively interfere with the input. So the question is, how do we deal with this if we want to make an oscillator out of this amplifying circuit? The answer is that we need to shift the output of the signal enough to compensate for the amplifier produced phase shift so that the resulting phase shift is actually 360 degrees out of phase or in phase with the input. We know that in the case of AC signals, reactance results in a phase shift. So we might expect that by adding resistance and inductance or resistance and capacitance to the output that we might be able to shift it. So how might we be able to design doing that? Well, let's think in terms of an RC uh, network. In that case, we can think about the total impedance as composed of pure resistance and a reactive component in this case, capacitive reactance component. So here is a uh, kind of simple RC circuit fed by an AC source. And this is the plane where on one axis you've got resistance and the other axis is reactance. In the positive uh, part of the plane, that corresponds to inductive reactance and the negative half of the plane corresponds to capacitive reactance. And the impedance is, of course, 
the complex or vector sum of the resistance and the reactive components. And this is the usual formula that one finds in the textbooks. In this case, because we've only got capacitive reactants, we know that the impedance is simply the hypotenuse now of resistance on one leg and the capacitive reactants on the other leg. And in particular, you know that the phase shift or the angle between the total impedance and the resistive part of the network uh, is given by relation whereby you take the tangent of that phase shift, that's the opposite leg of the triangle over the adjacent leg of the triangle. And so you have the tangent is equal to x sub c over r. Uh, and then you can just do some algebra whereby you can show that the tangent of the phase shift is equal to 1 over 2 pi f rc. This gives us all the information we need to achieve a certain amount of phase shift for a given network of R and C. Often we try a series of RC networks or RC blocks because it's impossible to shift the signal enough with a single RC block. So we can simply add on a number of RC elements uh, one after another and accumulate the needed phase shift because phase shifting is a linear operation or put differently phase shifts simply add up. Well let's pick three RC blocks and consider that to add to our output of the amplifier uh, and then feed that back into the input of the amplifier. We can of course pick each one of these blocks so that R and C is independent but usually you do it so that they are all the same. Uh, and given the formula that we had before, we can invert that and calculate the phase shift for a single RC element as the tan inverse of X sub C over R. And since we want three of them, we know that each one has to produce about 60 degrees of phase shift. So uh, let's just, uh, for a particular frequency that we're able to choose, let's take that to be one kilohertz. Uh, and let's pick a nice round uh, number for resistance as one kilo ohm. Then when you do this calculation to get 60 degrees, you can solve it for the capacitance needed. And that turns out to be 10 to the minus 7 farad, or 0.1 micro farad, or equivalently 100 nano farad. So this is the resulting circuit that we get, where we have the amplifier that we uh, showed earlier, uh, and then we just feed off some of the output and cycle it back in to the input, but running it through this phase shifting network. Let's see how well that works. What I've done is I've simply hooked up the output of the amplifier into the input of this phase shifting network, taken the output of the phase shifting network and fed it back into the input of the amplifier and we've constructed that network out of the values for resistors and capacitors that we just calculated. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the input signal at this point in the circuit. That's the yellow trace there. Uh, fairly sinusoidal looking, maybe a little distorted. And next, let's look at the signal at this point in the circuit, the output of the amplifier. You can see that, as expected, uh, the output is several times larger than the input and that they are 180 degrees out of phase. Now, let's look at the signal at this point in the circuit, which will be the pink trace, or purple, depending on how sensitive your retinas are to color. And you see that the purple is shifted over from the blue line. In other words, this is approximately 60 degrees out of phase with this signal there. And if we go to the next point in the circuit, this point right here, we'll show that now in a different trace. Uh, and this trace uh, is 
not displayed on the same um, volts per division or millivolts per division scale that I had. I'm blowing it up just to show that they are uh, very much uh, shifted again. So this is shifted back another 60 degrees. All right. So we're not quite 180 degrees uh, out of out of phase with respect to the input signal. Uh, but if I change now my probe to the last point right here signal and I turn off uh, everything else you can see now that the phase shift network has in fact achieved 180 degrees phase shift with respect to the output or 360 degrees with respect to the input. In other words, we've achieved 180 degrees uh, phase shift so that the amplifier output now when fed back into the input through the phase shifting network has constructive interference, not destructive interference. So I think that's kind of neat how one can go from you know very simple uh, circuit theory and design a uh, series of very elementary building blocks uh, in order to come up with a way of achieving uh, an end goal, which in this case is phase shifting an output and feeding it back into an amplifier circuit to come up with a stable oscillator. Well, I hope you found this interesting, and if so, please give it a big thumbs up below. There'll be more videos to come. And as always, thank you for watching.